Hi, this is Karen Rudolph from the University of Illinois. Today I'll be discussing an ongoing line of research in my lab that investigates the role of interpersonal stress in adolescent depression and in explaining the gender difference that emerges in depression during this period. I'm going to give a bit of a historical perspective about where we started with this work, talk about how this research progressed, and then discuss where we're headed from here. We started with the goal of understanding two very well-established developmental phenomena that are associated with depression. First, there's a sharp rise in depression that occurs during adolescence. And second, there's an emergence of a gender difference in depression, with females showing higher levels than males starting at about 13 to 15 years of age. And this gender difference continues throughout the lifespan. We were interested in answering the question of why we might see these developmental trends. So here's an overview of a comprehensive model of the development of depression that has guided my research over the years. The model highlights how genetic factors and early social adversity undermine the development of biological, psychological, and social competencies, which then puts at youth at risk both for generating more stress in their relationships and for showing maladaptive responses to interpersonal stress when it does occur, which then results in depression. Today, I plan to talk about a piece of this model that focuses on how challenges during the transition to adolescence contribute to the rising rates of depression in girls, and how both early social adversity and recent interpersonal stress play a role in this process. Depression might then further interfere with normative development by causing girls to generate even more stress in their relationships. So we first set out to understand the types of social contextual challenges that girls face as they progress through adolescence. Adolescence is a time when youth have to create independent social networks. They begin to rely more on their friends for intimacy and support. There's also often a disruption in their peer groups as they um, begin to form uh, different types of cliques and friendships, and they begin to get involved in romantic relationships. And adolescence also is a time when youth have more control over selecting their own friends. So they may select into stressful friendships and start engaging in more risk-taking behaviors that also can create stress in their relationships. And finally, a reorganization of the family occurs as I try to balance between autonomy and connectedness. So we thought that girls may be more likely than boys to experience more stress related to these changes for several different reasons. Girls show more connection-oriented social goals, so they may be more troubled when their friendship groups shift or if they have a breakup with a romantic partner. And girls also have more investment in their close friendships, so, for example, they're more sensitive to relationship threats. They show more jealousy in relationships. And girls' desire to gain autonomy from their parents increases, but parents tend to show more controlling behavior with girls and boys, which may create more conflict. So interpersonal disruption that occurs during the adolescent transition might create more stress for girls than for boys. So we started out with a very simple premise that interpersonal stress levels would increase during adolescence, particularly in girls. Now for the most part, I'm going to be talking about general measures of interpersonal stress that incorporate stress in the peer group, friendships, romantic relationships, and the family. But at times throughout the talk, I will distinguish some among these domains. And we were interested in three types of interpersonal stress independent episodic stress, which is fateful life events that just occur to people that are typically beyond their control, dependent episodic stress or self-generated life events, events that uh, youth contribute to in some way, and chronic strain or ongoing stressors in relationships. And the research that I'll discuss today used the Youth Life Stress Interview to assess stress. This is a semi-structured interview that provides a comprehensive measure of stress across all domains of children's lives. And the goal of the interview is to disentangle objective stressors from subjective distress that's created by the stressors. To do this, uh, information is presented to an objective coding team 
that rates each event for how stressful it would be to the typical child and how dependent the event was on youth's own behavior. And then the team also rates the degree of chronic strain experienced in various domains. My central focus today, as I said, is going to be on stressors occurring within interpersonal domains, such as conflicts or separations or loss of a relationship. But to examine the specificity of some of our findings, I'll sometimes contrast these with the effects for non-interpersonal stress in domains such as uh, school-related stress, health, financial stressors. And we assess depressive symptoms with the KIDDI-SADS, which is a semi-structured diagnostic interview from which we derived continuous scores of depression. In the first study, we examined a wide uh, age range of youth um, from about 8 to 18 years, and we divided them into pre-adolescence and adolescence. As we expected, we found that adolescent girls experienced significantly higher levels of interpersonal episodic stress than pre-adolescent girls, and this difference here was due specifically to self-generated or dependent stressors. The pre-adolescent and adolescent boys did not differ in the amount of interpersonal episodic stress they were exposed to. Uh, when we looked at non-interpersonal stress, there were no differences for girls, but adolescent boys experienced more non-interpersonal stress than pre-adolescent boys. And again, interestingly, this difference was due to differences in dependent stressors. Similarly, adolescent girls but not boys showed higher levels of interpersonal chronic strain. So overall, adolescence was a time of enhanced stress, uh, but it was interpersonal stress in girls and non-interpersonal stress in boys. We further hypothesized that exposure to higher levels of social stress in adolescent girls would help to account for the gender difference in depression that emerges during this time. Exposure to stress may lead to self-blame and low self-worth if the cause of the stress is internalized. It may interfere with the development of effective self-regulation and may also lead to a sense of hopelessness about the ability to improve one's relationships. Also, girls with higher levels of interpersonal stress may not receive some of the benefits of having healthy relationships, such as gaining emotional support or intimacy. And all of these factors may contribute to higher levels of depression in girls. We examined this hypothesis in an early adolescent sample of 5th to 8th graders. And here we looked specifically at stress in the friendship domain. And as we expected, higher levels of friendship stress accounted for the gender difference in depression. Now, in addition to adolescent girls experiencing more interpersonal stress than boys, we also thought they may be more reactive to this stress when it does occur. Adolescent girls show more maladaptive cognitive and behavioral responses to stress. They show more hormonal and neural sensitivity to social stress and higher levels of social evaluative concerns, worrying about what other people think of them, how they're being judged, and all of these might lead to stronger links between interpersonal stress and depression. So we then examined the hypothesis that girls would show higher levels of depression in the context of interpersonal stress than boys. So in other, girls, girl, in other words, girls would be more reactive to interpersonal stress. So these are results from the sample of 8 to 18 year olds I mentioned before. And we examined several stress indexes, including measures of interpersonal stressful life events, both independent and dependent, chronic strain, and also conflict in relationships. And what I'm showing you here in this uh, slide is the size of the correlation coefficients in girls in pink and boys in blue. We found that higher levels of relationship stress, particularly dependent interpersonal stress, were strongly associated with depression in girls. A couple of indexes of stress were associated with depression in boys, but as you can see, the associations were weaker and less consistent, and they were significantly stronger in girls. When we looked at non-interpersonal stress, there were actually no significant associations between stress and depression severity in girls or in boys. Now, these earlier findings were just a beginning um, stage of looking at our model, and they were based on concurrent data. So we couldn't determine the direction of the effects. Unfortunately, adolescents can get 
can get caught up in an escalating cycle in which depression causes them to act in ways that they generate stress in their lives, which then maintains or maybe even exacerbates their depression. And depression during adolescence may have particularly adverse effects because it interferes with adolescents' ability to deal with all of the new challenges that they're experiencing during this stage. It may also be particularly problematic in girls because relationships tend to be more emotionally demanding and require stronger emotional resources. So when girls are depressed, they may not be able to face all of these stressors. They may create relationship problems, which then perpetuate their depression. So our fourth hypothesis was that the generation of interpersonal stress would account in part for the continuity of depression over time in girls. We examined this idea using a transactional model in a three-wave longitudinal study of fourth through eighth graders. As we expected, um, in girls, which are the numbers are noted here in pink, we found that depression one year significantly predicted the generation of stress over the next year, which then predicted depression the following year. And there was a significant indirect effect, which accounted for part of the continuity in girls' depression over time. In boys, noted here in blue, depression did not predict the subsequent generation of interpersonal stress. And interpersonal stress did not predict depression. Boys also showed no significant continuity in depression over time. And this cycle was specific to interpersonal stress. So here I'm showing the numbers for non-interpersonal stress. And although depression in girls did predict the generation of non-interpersonal stress as well, non-interpersonal stress did not predict subsequent depression. So far we've looked at how gender may influence exposure and reactivity to interpersonal stress, and we've seen how girls can get caught up in a self-perpetuating cycle between depression and interpersonal stress. We've also talked in general about how adolescence serves as a high-risk context for stress, exposure, and reactivity. Now what I'd like to do is expand a bit on the developmental aspects of this model by considering how the challenges associated specifically with puberty may play a role in these processes. Although some research shows links between changes in sex-linked hormones at puberty and depression, the evidence here is somewhat mixed and weak. So to fully understand the role of puberty and depression, we need to consider its psychological and social implications. During puberty, adolescents start to engage in more uh, self and more social evaluation and social comparison. Uh, body image concerns can arise. You start becoming more involved in opposite, opposite sex relationships and romantic relationships. And more advanced puberty is associated with increases in family conflict. Now, many youth experience at least some of these challenges during puberty. But some theories suggest that the transition through puberty may be particularly challenging for youth who enter this stage off time relative to their peers. And there are two models that have been proposed to account for this effect. So on the left, the stage termination model suggests that early timing interrupts normative developmental tasks. So youth are basically not psychologically prepared to deal with the changes, and they lack the necessary coping resources. Early time in youth, we know, also face more social pressures because they become involved in affiliations with older uh, and often deviant peer groups and precocious dating. On the right, the maturational deviance uh, model suggests that off-time development, whether earlier or later than pe peers, can threaten youth's desire to conform, which is really strong during this stage. It can result in alienation from peers and insecurity, and it causes a lack of social support because they don't have peers around them who are similar, who are going through the same experiences at the same time. So under both of these models, all of these issues would collectively heighten risk for depression. Now, the stage termination model and the maturation, maturational deviance model were developed to understand puberty in both boys and girls and how it might affect their development. Uh, but there are some gender differences that we need to consider in the meaning of the pubertal transition. For girls, many of the physical changes that are associated with puberty 
such as increases in weight and body fat and menarche, are actually considered undesirable. So for girls, early maturation may be the most problematic because these girls are experiencing these undesirable changes before their peers. For boys, many of the physical changes associated with puberty, such as increases in height and muscle mass and accompanying athleticism, are actually desirable. So boys who have not matured when many of their peers have may be at the most risk. If we look at prior research, um, it generally supports the idea that early maturation poses a risk for depression in girls. In boys, the evidence is more mixed. So some research shows risk associated with late maturation, some shows risk associated with early maturation, and actually some research shows less risk in boys related to puberty. What we were particularly interested in is how puberty and adolescent social context might work together to contribute to the gender difference in adolescent depression such that early or late maturing youth who have compromised peer networks, low quality friendships, or high levels of family adversity may have a harder time negotiating the changes that are often associated with puberty, and so they might be more at risk for depression. Specifically, we predicted that early maturation in girls and early or late maturation in boys would be more strongly associated with depression in high than low stress social contexts. We assess puberty using two measures, the pubertal development scale, which describes a variety of somatic changes associated with puberty, and line drawings of the Tanner stages, which depict secondary sexual characteristics. We created a composite measure of actual timing, which reflected pubertal status residualized on age. And then youth also completed a self-report measure of perceived timing, uh, with whether they thought their development was earlier or later than other boys or girls their age. So first we examined interactions with stress and peer relationships. And as we expected, for concurrent depression, we found that earlier pubertal timing in girls and later pubertal timing in boys were associated with higher levels of depression at high but not low levels of peer stress. So the yellow lines here are high peer stress, the purple lines are low peer stress. And you can see that there's a significant association in girls for earlier pubertal timing and in boys for later, later pubertal timing with depression only in the high stress groups. When we examined the effects of puberty and peer stress over time, we also found that earlier pubertal timing was associated with more depression under high but not low stress, again the yellow line here, but this effect was actually similar for girls and boys. Interestingly, when we looked at perceived timing, so the adolescents' perceptions of whether their timing was earlier or later than other uh, children their age, the longitudinal results were similar to the concurrent results for actual timing. So at high but not low levels of peer stress, earlier perceived timing in girls and later perceived timing in boys predicted higher levels of depression over time. And then similar to the pattern for peer stress here, we're looking at family stress. So the yellow line is high recent family stress and the purple is low recent family stress. We found that earlier pubertal timing predicted higher levels of subsequent depression in both girls and boys exposed to high but not low levels of family stress. So these findings suggest that puberty and interpersonal stress work together to increase risk for depression. The pattern for girls was consistent in that early maturation poses a risk, but the findings for boys were more mixed. Initially, later maturation seemed to pose a risk, but over time, earlier maturation. We were interested in better understanding how puberty affects depression over time. So next, we conducted some analyses that uh, separated out the initial versus the enduring effects of pubertal timing. To do this, we used four waves of data across four years, and we conducted within subjects analyses using latent growth curve modeling, which has several advantages. It can help us detect longitudinal effects across several waves, uh, and it allows you to determine the pattern of change in depression over time within individuals, and can also provide information about youth's absolute level of depression at each wave. And we also conducted a multi-group comparison of girls and boys to examine gender differences 
in the growth of depression that's associated with early puberty. We predicted that early maturation in girls will predict higher initial depression and persistent depression over time, whereas late maturation in boys will predict lower initial depression but increasing depression over time. So these are graphs of the results from the latent growth curve analyses that examined whether pubertal timing predicted the initial levels, trajectories of depressive symptoms across four years, and final levels of depression. And as you can see here with the line that's noted by the yellow arrow, early maturing girls showed high initial depression that remained stable across the study. If you look here at the yellow brackets, early maturing boys showed significantly lower levels of depression than did early, uh, early maturing girls. But there was no significant difference in depression between early maturing girls and boys by the end of the study. So early maturation predicted more depression in girls and boys by the end of the study. Now when we turn to late maturing boys, they showed significantly higher initial depression than late maturing girls. But this difference had dissipated by the end of the study. And actually the late maturing boys, as you can see, had the lowest levels of depression overall by the end of the study. So we were then interested in what processes might explain these different patterns in girls and boys. And we looked at interpersonal stress, not surprisingly, as one factor. We also looked at different psychological and behavioral characteristics of youth that help explain these uh, gender differences, but I won't be discussing those today. We thought that girls might follow what uh, I'm going to call a proximal and enduring risk model. So early maturation in girls is associated with teasing and more victimization, and early maturing girls get involved in precocious dating and romantic relationships, and they experience more family conflict. We assumed that this interpersonal stress would result in depression right away, and once girls are launched onto this trajectory of risk, the negative consequences that occur may continue to propel them along this path, and that would maintain depression over time. In contrast, we thought boys might follow more of a progressive risk model. Early maturation in boys may provide an initial edge. They are developing all of these desirable characteristics, which might give them more confidence and social stature. But the risk might accumulate over time. Early maturing boys also begin to affiliate with deviant peers. They're in more precocious romantic and sexual relationships. Um, these experiences might create more stress in their relationships. Boys might suffer some of the longer-term consequences associated with affiliating with risky peers. So overall, we predicted that early maturing girls' maintenance of depression, in other words, they start out more depressed and stay more depressed, would be accounted for by higher initial levels of interpersonal stress. And early maturing boys' increasing depression would be accounted for by increasing levels of interpersonal stress over time. Again, we conducted latent growth curve analyses in which we have initial levels of pubertal maturation predicting initial and changing levels of interpersonal stress, which predicted initial and changing levels of depression. I know this slide has a lot of numbers and is a little bit confusing, but I'm just going to walk you through uh, the paths of interest. So um, if you see here in the uh, pink bolded path and then the uh, numbers have the yellow box around them, we found that early maturation predicted more initial interpersonal stress for girls, but not for boys. And then if you look at the second bolded arrow and box, initial interpersonal stress predicted higher initial levels of depression for girls and boys, although the relationship was significantly stronger for girls. And then for girls, there was a significant indirect effect of early maturation on initial depression through initial interpersonal stress. Now in contrast, if you look at the bolded blue line, for boys but not girls, early maturation predicted increases in interpersonal stress over time. And in turn, increases in interpersonal stress predicted increases in depression for boys and girls. For boys, there was a significant indirect effect of early maturation on increases in depression through increases in interpersonal stress. 
So early maturing boys showed increasing interpersonal stress over time, which then predicted increases in depression. Finally, we examined whether we could account for girls' and boys' levels of depression at the end of the study, in other words, the enduring effects of early maturation. In girls, we found that early maturation was indirectly associated with wave 4 depression at the end of the study through heightened initial interpersonal st stress. So in other words, the enduring effect of this initial stress accounted for early maturing girls' continued depression at the end of the study. In boys, early maturation was indirectly associated with depression at the end of the study through increases in interpersonal stress. So increasing stress accounted for early maturing boys' higher levels of depression by the end of the study. So we've now discussed how social context and the challenges of puberty act together to increase risk for depression in girls, and to some extent in boys as well. And the final area that I want to discuss today is the social origins of stress reactivity. Research shows that social adversity is a strong risk factor for depression. And we wondered whether this is in part because it influences how youth respond to later stress in their lives, particularly when they're facing the challenges of puberty. Now, there are a couple of possible ways in which early adversity may make youth more reactive to later stress. So on the left here, I'm showing uh, what a stress amplification model would look like. This model proposes that childhood adversity amplifies depressive reactions to recent stress. So youth who have a history of adversity would show more depression than those without a history when they're exposed to moderate or severe, but not mild, recent stressors. According to a stress sensitization model, childhood adversity reduces an individual's threshold for depressive reactions to recent stress. So youth with a history of adversity would require only mild or moderate stress to trigger depression, whereas youth without a history would require more severe levels of, of stress to become depressed. So based on these models, we predicted that a history of adversity would make youth more reactive to later interpersonal stress, either in the form of stress uh, amplification or stress sensitization. We used the YLSI to assess exposure to lifetime adversity, such as death, separations, or conflict, and uh, other major stressful events and circumstances. And then an objective coding team provided a rating of cumulative adversity on a 10-point scale. So across all of the types of lifetime adversity that ex they experienced, how much was it overall? And then we divided the youth into prepubertal and pubertal. And we conducted logistic regressions to distinguish the percent of youth who either had no or mild symptoms versus moderate or diagnosable depression. And what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the percent who are depressed, meaning they had either moderate or diagnosable depression. If you look at the yellow line on the left side, we found that prepubertal girls exposed to high adversity were more likely to experience significant depression at high but not mild or moderate stress levels. The prepubertal girls uh, who were exposed to lower moderate adversity, so the purple and the green lines here, rarely experienced significant depression regardless of their level of stress. But things looked a little bit different in pubertal girls. In pubertal girls uh, who were exposed to high levels of adversity, so again the yellow line, they were more likely to experience significant depression when they were exposed to moderate or high stress. And even at mild levels, 25% of pubertal girls exposed to high levels of early adversity experienced significant depression, compared to none of the girls exposed to low adversity. And then again, the green and purple lines are girls exposed to low and moderate levels of adversity. They look very similar, and they were basically unaffected by low or moderate levels of stress, but they were more reactive to high levels of stress. So the pattern in prepubertal girls seems to reflect a stress amplification effect, and the pattern in pubertal girls reflects a stress sensitization effect. 
In, in pubertal girls, they're more reactive at high levels of stress, but in prepubertal girls, early adversity lowers the threshold for responding to stress. These results suggest that to understand risk for depression in adolescent girls, we need to consider early contextual influences that may affect how girls negotiate stressors during this time. So girls with high levels of early adversity may respond to even milder stressors with depression. Most recently, we're starting to explore how exposure to early social adversity may get inside the skin to sensitize biological stress response systems in ways that create heightened stress sensitivity. And in particular, we're interested in neural sensitivity to social stress. So our first look at this involved measuring lifetime social adversity, not with the youth life stress interview, but by classifying adolescent girls according to their history of peer victimization, which was assessed prospectively from the second to eighth grades in a longitudinal study. We selected two extreme groups of girls. One included 24 chronically victimized girls, and the other included 23 non-victimized girls. In the ninth grade, the girls participated in a scan session, and while they were in the scanner, they played a game of cyberball, which is a laboratory manipulation of social exclusion. In prior research, being excluded during cyberball has been found to activate a region of the brain associated with the affective component of physical pain, uh, called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And this activation has been conceptualized as indicative of social pain that results from rejection. We were interested in whether chronic exposure to victimization would be associated with more DACC activation to exclusion. So using whole brain independent sample t-tests, we found as we expected that chronically victimized girls showed greater DACC activation to exclusion relative to inclusion compared to non-victimized girls. And DACC activation to exclusion relative to inclusion was it significantly associated with internalizing symptoms, including depression. These results suggest that exposure to chronic social adversity primes adolescent girls for experiencing more social pain, and this neural sensitivity is associated with depression. We're now collecting more data on neural sensitivity to rejection and other negative social feedback along with exposure to life stress using the YLSI in a longitudinal study of adolescent girls. So this study will allow us to examine in more depth how early adversity, neural sensitivity, and recent interpersonal stress collectively play a role in depression over time. Okay, and finally, I want to um, thank the many people who contributed to this research. Um, what I described today took place over many years and many different studies, and so I want to acknowledge all of the students and collaborators that were involved in the research, as well as the funding sources that made it possible, the National Institute of Mental Health, the WT Grant Foundation, and the University of Illinois Research Board. I hope this talk was helpful and appreciate everyone for listening.